Today's story contains content that may be disturbing to some people. Please only watch this video if you are in a good headspace because it is honestly horrific. Today I will be talking about Jeffrey Dahmer. Hello and welcome to my channel and my podcast, Kate Sharon True Crime. My name is Kate and here I talk about true crime, mysteries, history and anything that interests me. Please remember to show your support by liking this video, subscribing to my channel and hitting the notification bell so that you never miss out on any of my future videos. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about Jeffrey Dahmer. Yep, that Jeffrey Dahmer. There is a disclaimer on this one, obviously. I will be going into detail on his crimes. So if you don't want to hear all the gory details, please click out now and come back another time with a different case. Also, I have decided that any proceeds from this story will go to the Milwaukee Crime Stoppers. I have always wanted to help victims and their families and I think that this could be a really good starting point. So I'm thinking I'm going to give it like a month uh, just to raise enough money from whoever watches this video before I make the donation and when I do make the donation I will pop a screenshot of the payment and a big thank you to everybody who has supported me. So please watch the full video and the ads that pop up so that we can make as much money together as humanly possible to go towards this cause. Also, if you can spare a few bucks and click the super thanks on this video, that would be fantastic because that money will also go on the donation to Crime Stoppers Milwaukee. So Milwaukee Crime Stoppers is funded by private donations, sponsorships and fundraising. They don't receive help from the government. So since the start of Crime Stoppers, many calls have been received and they have resulted in thousands of arrests and recovery of substantial amounts of property. Calls have included information about murder, robbery, the R word, assaults, drug and firearms offences, etc, etc. But they can't do all this good work without funding, hence why I have decided that any money I make from this video will be donated to them. So please do consider hitting the super thanks button and also, like I said, watching the full video and the ads because that's how I get paid. Okay, and with that, let's jump into today's story. So Jeffrey Dahmer, oh, this guy, he was born on May the 21st in 1960 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and he was the first of two sons to Lionel and Joyce Dahmer. Some people have said that Jeff was deprived of attention as a baby and toddler, while other people say that he was actually doted on by both of his parents. <sighs> Jeff says that they argued a lot when he was a kid and that his dad was really supportive but his mum was a little bit less. So as Jeff entered first grade, Lionel's studies kept him away from home quite a bit of the time and when he was home Joyce she kind of demanded most of his attention so she'd be you know starting arguments with him and the kids they were witness to all this so it wasn't a great environment but it was just you know parental arguments. Jeff later said that he felt unsure of the solidity of his family recalling extreme tension and numerous arguments between his parents during his early years. Jeff didn't understand why they argued so much. Some people just don't like each other. <laughs> Jeff later said that his parents did argue quite a lot, but he wants to make it very clear that his parents arguing wasn't the reason why he turned out the way he did. So Jeff had been quite an energetic child and he was happy until he was about four when he went for a double hernia operation. After that he changed, he became more subdued, not as happy 
and at school in elementary school he was regarded as quiet and timid and one of his teachers later said that she detected early signs of abandonment due to his father's absence and his mother's illnesses. So in October of 1966 the family moved to Doylestown, Ohio and Joyce gave birth to their second son. Jeff was allowed to choose his new brother's name and he decided that he would call him David. So from an early age, Jeffrey was very interested in dead animals and his fascination with dead animals may have begun when at the age of four, he saw his dad removing animal bones from underneath the family home. According to Lionel, Jeff's dad, Jeff seemed to be oddly thrilled by the sounds that the bones made. So when his dad was putting them into like a container or like a bucket, they make a sound and Jeff seemed to really like that sound and he started dropping the bones in and he started calling them his fiddlesticks. So in May of 1968 the family moved to Bath Township, Summit County in Ohio. Their new home stood in one and a half acres of woodland with a small hut only a short walk from the house where Jeff began collecting large insects and the skeletons of small animals such as chipmunks and squirrels. So some of these remains were preserved in jars and kept in his hut. Two years later, during a chicken dinner, Jeff asked his dad what would happen if you put chicken bones in bleach. And Lionel, at the time, he was quite pleased by what he believed to be his son's scientific curiosity. Because Lionel's a scientist and he showed Jeff how to bleach these chicken bones. Oh, if only he knew at that time what was going to happen. So according to one friend, Jeff explained to him that he was curious as to how animals fit together. And in 1975, he actually decapitated the carcass of a dog before he nailed the body to a tree and he stuck the head on a stick. Yeah. Then, as a prank, he later invited one of his friends over and, like, calmly showed him this dog. Yeah. And he claimed that he just found it like that. So, in high school, Jeff was seen as a bit of an outcast, and by age 14, he had begun drinking quite a bit. He was drinking at school, and one of his friends at school actually asked him why he was drinking. And he just kind of turned to her and said, It's my medicine. Jeff didn't have many friends at school, but he was seen by the teachers as polite and highly intelligent, but with average grades. Probably didn't help that he was drinking, and he just did, didn't really seem to care. Jeff realized when he was a teenager that he was gay, but he chose not to tell his parents, and he had a brief relationship with another teenage boy. Jeff later said that he didn't like that he was gay. He found it very inconvenient. So when Jeff was about 16, he had a fantasy of rendering unconscious a particular male jogger that he found attractive and then making sexual use of his body. He started having these thoughts that he wanted like a, a, a completely submissive partner. So on one occasion, he waited in the bushes with a bat for this jogger to go past. Luckily, that jogger did not go past that day. Jeff later said that this was his first attempt to attack and render an individual submissive. So apparently in high school, Jeff was the class clown and he often pulled pranks on people, which became known as doing a dharma. He would do things like fake seizures or like he would run around going like, oh, the, the, there's a fire, there's a fire, and just silly things. So by 1977, his grades started to drop even more, so his parents got him a tutor. Unfortunately, that didn't seem to help, probably because he was drinking. So the same year, in an attempt to save their marriage, Jeff's parents, they started going to couples therapy, but they still argued just as much. Lionel actually found out that Joyce was having an affair in September of 1977, and they eventually decided to get a divorce. In May of 1978, Jeffrey graduated from high school and that spring, Joyce, she decided to basically up and leave. So her and Lionel, they had their divorce settled and she got custody of the kids 
as she took David and left 18 year old Jeff at the family home. Okay now I'm going to get into the crimes it's it's quite graphic so feel free to click out and come back another time with a different case but like I said um, also any money made from the story will be going to Milwaukee Crime Stoppers so I do appreciate any sort of help you guys can can offer. All right, so Jeffrey Dahmer, he committed his first murder in 1978. This was three weeks after he graduated from high school. On June 18th, he picked up a hitchhiker. This was 19-year-old Stephen Mark Hicks. Stephen was on his way to a rock concert in Ohio, and he had a bit of time to kill. So Jeff decided to pull over and pick him up. Jeff asked him if he would like to maybe hang out for a bit, have some drinks, lift some weights, just chill out a bit at his place until they had to leave to go to the concert. So according to Jeffrey, the sight of Stephen's body, because he was not wearing a shirt, really turned him on. But Stephen on the drive to Jeff's house, he was talking about girls. So Jeff realized that any sexual passes he made would most likely be rejected. They get to the house, they have a few drinks, a few hours go by, they're listening to music, and Stephen wanted to leave. He wanted to get to his concert. But the thing is, Jeff didn't want him to leave. So he ended up hitting him in the head with a 10 pound dumbbell, twice. Stephen was knocked out cold, and Jeff then strangled him to death. Then Jeff lay down next to Stephen's body and felt him up. Then he began to masturbate over his dead body. A few hours later, he dragged Stephen's body to the basement. The following day, he dissected Stephen's body in the basement and he buried the remains in a shallow grave in his backyard. Several weeks would go by and he decided that he was going to dig up Stephen's remains. That's when he peeled the flesh from the bones. Then he dissolved the flesh in acid before flushing the solution down the toilet. Then he crushed the bones with a sledgehammer and scattered them in the woodland behind his home. Jeff said that he didn't want Stephen to leave, so that's why he kept him at his home. He also threw Stephen's necklace and the knife that he used to dismember him off the West Bath Road bridge into the river. Six weeks after this, Jeffrey's dad and his new fiance returned to the home where they found that Jeff was living alone. Jeff's dad wasn't too impressed that Joyce wasn't there and he decided that he needed to help his son. So that August, Jeffrey enrolled at Ohio State University. So he went to live on site, well, he went to live on campus, hoping to major in business, but because he drank so much, his grades were failing. One time, Jeff's dad did come to visit his son at uni and he found that his room was a complete mess. There were beer bottles everywhere. It was, it was just gross. And despite his dad having paid in advance for uni, Jeff dropped out. He only went to uni for three months. In January of 1979, Jeff enlisted in the United States Army and he underwent basic training before training as a medical specialist. But even during his time in the army, he still continued to drink heavily. Then on July 11th, 1979, Jeff was deployed to West Germany, where he served as a combat medic. According to published reports, he was an average or slightly above average soldier, and his drinking became a massive problem which resulted him in March of 1981 being discharged from the army. The army basically just gave him a plane ticket to anywhere in the country and he chose to go to Miami Beach, Florida. He arrives in Miami Beach, he didn't really tell his family where he was going and he lived in like a motel. But he was spending all of his money on booze and he couldn't afford the motel. He did get himself a job, but he also spent most of his salary on alcohol, and he soon was evicted from the motel for non-payment of rent. He ended up on the street and scared, so he called his dad and asked for some money, but
but his dad said no I'm not giving you money but I'll get you a ticket home so Jeff went home and initially he lived with his dad and his stepmom and he helped out around the house he did chores he wanted to please everybody he continued to drink though quite heavily and two weeks after he returned he was arrested for drunk and disorderly conduct he was fined $60 and given a suspended 10-day jail sentence. So Jeff's dad tried unsuccessfully to wean his son off alcohol and in December of 1981 he and Jeff's stepmom sent him to live with his grandma. She was in West Allis, Wisconsin. Jeff later said that his grandma was the only family member who displayed any affection towards him. But I don't believe that because I have seen so many interviews with Jeff and Jeff's dad sometimes both of them together and it is clear how much Lionel absolutely loves his son or loved his son Jeff would go to church with his grandma and he willingly did chores he actively sought work and he abided by most of her rules she did say no drinking but he continued to drink he also smoked which she didn't like in early 1982, he found a job at the Milwaukee Blood Plasma Center and only kept this job for a total of 10 months before he was laid off. He was actually selling his plasma for beer money. He remained unemployed for over two years and lived off whatever money he got from his grandma and money from his plasma and blood. He would sell it. He would get money for donating his blood and plasma. He was seen exposing himself and 25 people were present, including women and children. And for this incident, he was convicted and fined $50 plus court costs. Then in January of 1985, Jeff was hired as a mixer at the Milwaukee Ambrosia Chocolate Factory, where he worked from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. And he worked six nights a week with Saturday evenings off. Jeff began to go to the Milwaukee gay bars on his night off and also the gay bathhouses and bookstores. He also stole a male mannequin from a shop which he briefly used for sexual stimulation until his grandma discovered it and she demanded that he got rid of it. By late 1985, he had begun to regularly frequent the bathhouses which he later described as being quite relaxing places. But during his sexual encounters, he became frustrated because his partners, you know, they're moving around, they're talking, he didn't like that, he just wanted them to be quiet. So following his arrest, he said that he tried to train himself to view people as objects, objects of pleasure, not as people. And for this reason, beginning in June of 1986, he administered sleeping pills to his partners, giving them liquor laced with sedatives. He then waited for his victims to fall asleep before he would perform various sexual acts on them. So to maintain an adequate supply of this sleeping medication, he told his doctor that he needed it because he worked nights. After approximately 12 of these instances where he drugged these poor men, the bathhouses revoked his membership and he began to use hotel rooms. Shortly after his bathhouse memberships were revoked, he read a report in the newspaper about a young 18-year-old man who had died and his funeral was coming up. So he decided that he was going to go to the funeral and he did. And then after he went to steal the body, according to Jeff, he attempted to dig up the coffin from the ground, but he found that the saw was far too hard and he abandoned the plan. Then on September the 8th, 1986, he was arrested for masturbating in the presence of two 12-year-old boys. He initially said that he was going for a wee, but there were witnesses and he soon did admit that yes, he was masturbating and these, 12, these two 12-year-olds saw him. So the charge was changed to disorderly conduct and on March the 10th, 1987, he was sentenced to one year of probation with additional instructions to undergo counselling don't think counseling is going to be enough. On November the 20th, 1987, he met a 25-year-old man from Michigan called Stephen Tuomi. 
he was at a bar and he persuaded him to return to the ambassador hotel in Milwaukee where he was renting a room for the night. According to Jeff, he had no intention of hurting Stephen but intended to simply drug him and lay beside him while he felt up his body. The following morning he woke up and Stephen was kind of hanging off the bed. He had injuries to his chest and Jeff noticed that he also had injuries to his hands and forearm. Also blood was seeping out of the corner of Stephen's mouth. He later said that he had no memory of killing Stephen and that he could not believe that this had happened. That's when he purchased a large suitcase and he put Stephen's body inside it and he took it to his grandma's house. A week later he severed Stephen's arms, head and legs. Then he placed the flesh into bags and threw them into the trash. Then he smashed up the bones with a sledgehammer. Poor Stephen. He kept Stephen's head. For two weeks following this murder, he kept Stephen's head wrapped in a blanket. After two weeks, he decided to boil Stephen's head in a mixture of Zoilax and alkaline-based industrial detergent and bleach in an effort to retain the skull, which he then used to masturbate with. Eventually, the skull became too brittle because of the bleaching process, so he decided that he had to dispose of it by smashing it. He then began to actively seek his victims, most of who he had met in or around gay bars, and he would typically lure them to his grandma's house. He would drug his victim before or shortly after engaging in sexual activity with them, and once his victim was unconscious, he strangled them to death. Two months after he killed Stephen, Jeff met a 14-year-old boy. His name was James Doxtater, who he lured to his grandma's house with an offer of $50 to pose for nude pictures. They engaged in sexual activities before Jeff drugged and strangled him on the floor of the cellar. He left the body in the cellar for one week before he dismembered it in the same manner as he did with Stephen. He placed all of James's remains, excluding his skull, in the trash and the skull was boiled and cleansed in bleach before it too became too brittle by the bleaching process so he decided that he needed to get rid of it and he smashed it. On March 24th 1988 he met a 22 year old bisexual man called Richard Guerrero. He was outside a gay bar called The Phoenix. He lured him to his grandma's house and offered him $50 to spend the night with him. He drugged Richard with sleeping pills, he strangled him with a leather strap, and he dismembered his body. He then disposed of his remains in the trash and he kept the skull before he smashed it up several months later. On April the 23rd, he lured Ronald Flowers Jr. to his house. However, after giving him a drugged coffee, both he and Ronald heard Jeff's grandma call out. She asked, Jeff, is that you? Although Jeff replied in a manner that led his grandma to believe that he was alone, she knew he wasn't alone. She heard the voices. And that's when Jeff decided that he wasn't going to be able to kill Ronald. So he waited until he had become unconscious before he took him to the County General Hospital. In September of 1988, Jeffrey's grandma asked him to move out. She'd had enough. He was drinking way too much and he had a habit of bringing young men to her house late at night and also there was a really foul smell coming from the basement. Jeff moved out and he moved into a one-bedroom apartment at 808 North 24th Street and he moved in on September the 25th. Two days later, he was arrested for drugging and sexually fondling a 13-year-old boy who he had lured to his apartment on the pretext of posing nude for photographs. Lionel hired an attorney to defend his son. Jeff saw a psychologist and it revealed that he was an impulsive individual, suspicious of others, 
and dismayed by his lack of accomplishments in life. So his probation officer also referenced a 1987 diagnosis of Jeffrey suffering from a schizoid personality disorder for presentation to the court. So they're preparing for court. On January the 30th, 1989, Jeff pled guilty to the charge of second degree SA and of enticing a child for immoral purposes. Sentencing was suspended until May and on March the 20th, Jeffrey commenced a 10 day Easter absence from work during which he moved back to his grandma's house. Two months after his conviction and two months prior to his sentencing, he killed his fifth victim, a 24 year old mixed race aspiring model called Anthony Sears, who he had met at a gay bar on March the 25th, 1989. According to Jeffrey, on this particular occasion, he was not actually looking to commit a crime. However, shortly before closing time, Anthony had struck up a conversation with him and Jeff asked him if he wanted to go back to his grandma's house where they engaged in oral sex before Jeff drugged and strangled him. The following morning, he placed Anthony's body in his grandma's bathtub where he decapitated him before attempting to flay the corpse. He stripped the flesh from Anthony's body and he smashed up his bones, which he disposed of in the trash. According to Jeffrey, he found Anthony exceptionally attractive and he was the first victim from who he permanently retained any body parts. He kept Anthony's head and genitals and he stored them in a wooden box which he later placed in his work locker. When he moved to a new address the following year, he took Anthony's remains with him. On May 23rd, 1989, Jeffrey was sentenced to five years probation but he was given release to go to work. He was also required to register as a sex offender. Two months before his scheduled release, he was paroled. His five years probation imposed in 1989 began at this point and he temporarily moved back to his grandma's house. On May the 14th, 1990, Jeffrey moved out of his grandma's house and into 924 North 25th Street apartment 213, taking Anthony's mummified head and genitals with him. Although located in a high crime area, his new apartment was super close to his work. It was furnished and it was only $300 a month, which included all bills except for electricity. So within a week of moving to this address, Jeff killed his sixth victim, Raymond Smith. Raymond was a 32-year-old prostitute who Jeff lured to his apartment with the promise of $50 for sex. Inside the apartment, he gave Raymond a drink that was laced with seven sleeping pills. When Raymond fell unconscious, he strangled him. The following day, he purchased a Polaroid camera and he took a bunch of pictures of Raymond's body in suggestive positions before he dismembered him in the bathroom. He boiled his legs, his arms and pelvis in a steel kettle. He then dissolved the remainder of Raymond's body, excluding his skull, in a container that was filled with acid and later spray painted his skull, which he placed alongside the skull of Anthony upon a black towel inside a filing cabinet. Approximately a week later, on or about May the 27th, Jeffrey lured another young man to his apartment. On this occasion, he accidentally drank the drink with the sedatives intended for his guest and he passed out. When he woke up the following day, he realized that that man had stolen a bunch of his clothes, uh, $300 and a watch. But obviously he didn't report this to the police. Although on May the 29th, he did divulge this theft to his probation officer. In June 1990, Jeffrey lured a 27-year-old acquaintance, Edward Smith, to his apartment where he drugged and strangled him. 
on this occasion rather than immediately acidifying his skeleton or repeating previous processes of bleaching which had rendered previous victims skulls brittle he put Edward's skeleton in his freezer for several months in the hope that it would not retain moisture. So freezing the skeleton did not remove any moisture and the skeleton was acidified several months later and he accidentally destroyed the skull when he put it in the oven. He was trying to dry it out and it actually made the skull explode. Oh my god. Okay. Less than three months after he killed Edward Smith, he met a 22-year-old Chicago native called Ernest Miller outside a bookstore on the corner of North 27th Street and Edward agreed to go with him to his apartment for $50 and he further agreed to allow him to listen to his heart and his stomach. When Jeff attempted to perform oral sex on him, he told him that that'll cost you more. Jeff gave him a drink and it was laced with two sleeping pills because he only had two sleeping pills left. He passed out and that's when he killed him. He slashed his throat and Edward bled to death within minutes. Then Jeffrey posed his nude body for various suggestive Polaroid photographs before he placed him in the bathtub for dismemberment. Apparently, Jeffrey repeatedly kissed and talked to his severed head while he dismembered the rest of his body. He wrapped his heart, liver, biceps and portions of flesh from the legs in plastic bags and placed them in the freezer for later consumption. That is right, I said consum consumption. Three weeks later, on September the 24th, he met a 22-year-old father of two called David Thomas. He was at the Grand Avenue Mall and he persuaded him to go back to his apartment for a few drinks with additional money on offer if he would pose for photographs. So in a statement to police later, he said that after giving David a drink that was laced with sedatives, he decided that he wasn't actually attracted to him. But he was nervous for him to wake up because he thought he'll be angry if he wakes up and realizes that he was actually drugged. So he decided that he, he needed to get rid of him. So he killed him and he dismembered his body. He photographed the dismemberment process and retained these photographs, which later aided in David's identification. Following David's death, Jeff didn't kill anyone for almost five months. Although on a minimum of five occasions, he did try. So between October of 1990 and February 1991, he unsuccessfully attempted to lure men to his apartment. If you can hear that, that's my neighbor, they're mowing the lawn. In February of 91, Jeff observed a 17 year old boy called Curtis Strata standing at a bus stop at the Marquette University. He managed to lure him back to his apartment with the offer of money for posing for nude photographs with the added incentive of sexual intercourse. Jeff drugged Curtis, he cuffed his hands behind his back, then he strangled him to death with a leather strap. He then dismembered him, retaining his skull, hands and genitals, and he photographed each stage of the dismemberment process. Less than two months later, on April the 7th, he met a 19-year-old guy called Errol Lindsay. He was walking to get a key cut. Jeffrey lured him to his apartment where he drugged him, then drilled a hole into his skull through which he injected hydrochloric acid with a baser. According to Jeffrey, Errol woke up after this experiment and he said that he had a headache and he asked what time is it in response to this Jeff again drugged then strangled him he decapitated and retained his skull then flayed his body placing his skin in a solution of cold water and salt for several weeks in the hope of permanently retaining it but reluctantly he had to dispose of it because it became frayed and brittle. In 1991, the building manager spoke to Jeff 
and Jeff said that the smell was because his freezer broke and that his food was spoiled. On later occasions he said that the reason for the smell was that he had tropical fish and that they had recently died and that's why it smelled. On May the 24th, 1991, Jeffrey Dahmer encountered 31-year-old aspiring model Tony Hughes. They met at a nightclub. He managed to lure Tony back to his apartment with an offer of money to pose for photographs. Tony was drugged into unconsciousness before being injected with hydrochloric acid into his skull in an effort to disable his will and render him submissive. Although on this occasion, the drilling and injection proved fatal. It killed him. On the afternoon of May the 26th, 1991, Jeffrey encountered a 14-year-old Lao teenager called Conorak on Wisconsin Avenue. Unknown to Jeff, this boy was the younger brother of the boy that he had molested in 1988. Jeffrey offered him money to go back with him to his apartment to pose for Polaroid pictures. Jeff then gave him a drink that was drugged and he went unconscious. He performed oral sex on him, but before he fell unconscious, Jeffrey led the boy into his bedroom where the body of Tony Hughes, who he had killed three days earlier, still lay naked on the floor. According to Jeffrey, he believed he saw this body yet did not react to seeing the bloated corpse, likely because of the effects of the sleeping pills. On this occasion, Jeff drilled a single narrow hole into the crown of this poor boy's skull, through which he injected hydrochloric acid into the frontal lobe. Oh. This, this, is really so this is a really, really hard story for me. My God. Oh. Okay. I'm composing myself. So he left the apartment when had a few beers and in the early hours of May the 27th he returned to his apartment and he saw that Conorak was sitting naked on the corner of 25th and State. He was talking in Lao with three distressed women standing over him. Jeffrey approached the women and told them that he was his friend and attempted to lead him sorry to his apartment the three women told him that they had called the police and upon the arrival of two milwaukee police officers jeffrey's demeanor relaxed he told the officers that conorak was his 19 year old boyfriend and that he'd had too much to drink and that they had an argument conorak had blood on his testicles and he was bleeding from his rectum and he had struggled against Jeffrey's attempts to take him back upstairs. The women tried to tell police something wasn't right, but the officer harshly told them to butt out and basically shut the hell up and not to interfere. Shortly after the arrival of the Milwaukee police officers, three members of the Milwaukee Fire Department arrived at the scene. They examined Conorak for injuries and provided a yellow blanket for, for the police officers to cover him. One of the firefighters actually said that this boy needs help, but the police just basically told them to leave. The police then escorted Jeffrey and Conorak back up to Jeffrey's apartment. One officer simply peeked his head around the apartment, but he really didn't take a good look. The officer then left and this incident was listed by the police as a domestic dispute. Once the police left, Jeffrey again injected hydrochloric acid into Conorak's brain and this killed him. The following day, May the 28th, Jeffrey took a day's leave from work to devote his time to the dismemberment of the bodies that he had in his apartment. On June 30th, Jeffrey traveled to Chicago, where he encountered a 20-year-old called Matt Turner at a bus station. Matt accepted Jeffrey's offer to travel to Milwaukee for a professional photo shoot, and at the apartment, he was drugged, strangled, and dismembered. Jeffrey put his head 
and internal organs in separate plastic bags in the freezer. Matt wasn't reported missing. Five days later, on July the 5th, Jeffrey lured 23-year-old Jeremiah Weinberger from a Chicago bar to his apartment on the promise of spending the weekend with him. He drugged him and twice injected boiling water through his skull, sending him into a coma from which he died two days later. On July the 15th, Jeffrey met 24-year-old Oliver Lacey at the corner of 27th and Kilbourne. Oliver agreed to Jeffrey's ruse of posing nude for photographs and accompanied him back to his apartment where the pair engaged in sexual activity before Jeffrey drugged him. On this occasion, he intended to prolong the time that he spent with his victim. After unsuccessfully attempting to render him unconscious with chloroform, he phoned his workplace to request a day's absence. This was granted, although the next day he was suspended. After strangling Oliver, he had sex with his dead body before he dismembered him. He placed Oliver's head and heart in the refrigerator and his skeleton in the freezer. Four days later, on July 19th, Jeffrey lured 25-year-old Joseph Bradhoft to his apartment. He strangled and left him laying on the bed covered with a sheet for two days. On July the 21st, Jeffrey removed the sheet to find his head was actually covered in maggots. He decapitated his head and he cleaned it and then he placed it in the refrigerator. He later acidified the rest of his body along with those of two other victims killed within the previous month. On July the 22nd, 1991, Jeffrey Dahmer approached three men with the offer of $100 to accompany him to his apartment to pose for naked photographs. He asked them if they wanted to have some drinks and just hang out. One of the men, 32-year-old Tracy Edwards, agreed and he went with him. Upon entering the apartment, Tracy noted a foul odour and several boxes of hydrochloric acid on the floor, which Jeffrey claimed to use for cleaning bricks. After some minor conversation, Tracy responded to Dharma's request to turn his head and view his tropical fish. This is where he placed a handcuff on Tracy's wrist. When Tracy asked what's happening, Jeffrey unsuccessfully attempted to cuff his wrists together, then told Tracy to accompany him to the bedroom to pose for nude pictures. So Tracy went, he basically had no choice, and he noticed there were a lot of nude posters on the walls and the Exorcist 3 was playing. He also said that a blue 57 gallon drum in the corner, it smelled really bad. And Jeff then pulled out a knife and threatened Tracy. In an attempt to keep Jeffrey calm, Tracy unbuttoned, unbuttoned his shirt saying that he would allow him to do as he pleased. In response, Jeffrey simply turned his attention back to the TV. Tracy observed Dharma rocking back and forth and chanting before turning his attention back to him. He placed his head on Tracy's chest. He listened to his heartbeat and with the knife pressed against his intended victim, he told Tracy he was going to eat his heart. In attempts to prevent Jeff from attacking him, Tracy repeatedly said that he was his friend and that he wasn't going to run away. Tracy had decided that he was going to either jump from a window or run through the unlocked front door on the next available opportunity. Tracy asked if they could go have a drink in the living room where the air conditioning was and Jeffrey said yes. So they walked to the living room and Tracy waited for an opportunity to escape. Tracy got up from the couch and noticed that Jeffrey wasn't really paying attention and he wasn't holding the handcuffs anymore. So that's when Tracy decided he was gonna punch Jeffrey 
he punched Jeffrey in the face. Jeffrey lost his balance and at 11.30 p.m. on July the 22nd, Tracy was able to flag down two Milwaukee police officers. Tracy ran and he got the hell out of there. The officers tried to get the handcuffs off Tracy, but they didn't work. So they had to go to the apartment. Tracy told them where Jeffrey lived. They went to the apartment and Jeffrey invited them in. He admitted that he put handcuffs on Tracy, but said it was just gay sex play. At this point, Tracy told the officers that Jeffrey had also pulled a large knife on him and that this had happened in the bedroom. Jeffrey made no comment to this and told one of the officers that the key to the handcuffs were in his bedside dresser. As the officer entered the bedroom, Jeffrey attempted to push past him, but the second officer told him to back off. In the bedroom, the officer saw the large knife beneath the bed. Sorry, this is a really hard story. He saw an open drawer, which upon closer inspection contained Polaroid pictures, many of which were of human bodies in various stages of dismemberment. The officer noted the decor in the pictures were the same as the apartment. These were real. The officer then walked into the living room and showed his partner the pictures, uttering the words, these are real. When Jeff saw the officers had the pictures, he fought with them in an effort to resist arrest. The officers quickly overpowered him. They cuffed his hands behind his back and they called a second squad car for backup. At this point, one of the officers opened the refrigerator and they found the freshly severed head of a black male on the bottom shelf. As Jeffrey lay pinned on the floor beneath the other officer, he turned his head towards Tracy and he said, for what I did, I should be dead. A more detailed search of the apartment conducted by the Criminal Investigation Bureau revealed a total of four severed heads in Jeffrey Dahmer's kitchen. A total of seven skulls, some painted, some bleached, were found in his bedroom. In, also inside his closet. Investigators discovered collected blood drippings upon a tray at the bottom of Jeffrey Dahmer's refrigerator, plus two human hearts and a portion of an arm muscle each wrapped in plastic inside his fridge. In the freezer, investigators discovered the entire torso plus a bag of human organs and flesh stuck to the ice at the bottom. Elsewhere, investigators discovered two entire skeletons, a pair of severed hands, two severed and preserved penises, a mummified scalp, and in a 57 gallon drum, three further dismembered torsos dissolved in acid solution. A total of 74 Polaroid pictures detailing the dismemberment of Jeffrey's victims were also found. In the early hours of July the 23rd, 1991, Jeffrey Dahmer was questioned by Detective Patrick Kennedy as to the murders that he had committed and the evidence found at his apartment. Over the following two weeks, the detectives conducted numerous interviews with Jeffrey Dahmer, which when combined totaled over 60 hours. Jeffrey waived his right to have a lawyer present throughout his interrogations adding he wished to confess and he admitted to having murdered 16 young men in Wisconsin since 1987 with one further victim Stephen Hicks killed in Ohio in 1978. Jeffrey admitted to engaging in necrophilia with several of his victims bodies. <sighs> Jeffrey Dahmer said that he first removed their internal organs then suspended the torso so that the blood drained into the bathtub before dicing any organs he did not wish to retain and pairing the flesh from the body. The bones he wished to dispose of were pulverized or acidified and he confessed to having consumed the hearts, liver, biceps and portions of 
thigh of three victims that he had killed at the Oxford Apartments, Raymond Smith, Ernest Miller and Oliver Lacey, and to have retained the flesh and organs of the victims for intended consumption. He said that he consumed portions of his victims due to curiosity, describing the increase in his rate of killing in the two months prior to his arrest. Jeffrey stated that he had been completely swept along with his compulsion to kill, adding that it was a never-ending desire to be with someone at whatever cost. Someone good looking, really nice looking. It just filled my thoughts all day. That's what he said. When asked as to why he had preserved a total of seven skulls and the entire skeleton of two victims, Jeffrey Dahmer said that he had been in the process of constructing a private altar of victims' skulls, which he had intended to display on the black table located in his living room and upon which he had photographed the bodies of many of his victims. The display of skulls was to be adorned at each side with the complete skeletons of Miller and Lacey. The four severed heads found in his kitchen were to have all flesh removed and used in his altar, as was the skull of at least one future victim. And since sticks were to be placed at each end of the black table, above which Jeffrey intended to place a large blue lamp with extending blue globe lights. The entire construction was to be placed before a window covered with a black opaque shower curtain in front of which he intended to sit in a black leather chair. That is so freaking messed up. He said that if he had been arrested six months later, the police would have found his altar. On July 25th, 1991, Jeffrey Dahmer was charged with four counts of first degree murder and by August 22nd, he had been charged with a further 11 committed in Wisconsin. On September the 14th, investigators in Ohio uncovered hundreds of bone fragments in woodland behind the address where Jeffrey had confessed to killing his first victim, Stephen Hicks. And they formally identified two molars and a vertebra with x-ray records of Stephen Hicks. Three days later, Jeffrey was charged by authorities in Ohio with Stephen's death. Unfortunately, Jeffrey wasn't charged with the attempted murder of Tracy Edwards, nor with the murder of Stephen Tuomi. He was not charged with Stephen Tuomi's death because the Milwaukee County District Attorney only brought charges where murder could be proven beyond a reasonable doubt, and Jeffrey had no memory of actually committing this crime. Seriously? At a scheduled preliminary hearing on January 13th, 1992, Jeffrey Dahmer pleaded guilty, but insane, to 15 counts of murder, and his trial began on January the 30th, 1992. He was tried in Milwaukee for the 15 counts of first degree murder, and he pleaded guilty. Defense experts argued that Jeffrey was insane because of his necrophilic drive and having sexual encounters with corpses. Jeffrey Dahmer said that he preferred comatose partners to dead ones. He didn't actually want to kill them, apparently. Mm -hmm. From my time studying criminal law and psychology, I do think that he has ASPD, or ha he had ASPD. Jeffrey Dahmer knew what he was doing. He prepared. Like, he had, he knew. He had the pills. He, he knew what he was doing. Another person testified that Jeffrey had a longing for companionship that caused him to kill and testified that he was not psychotic and described him as pleasant to be around with a sense of humor, conveniently handsome and charming. Whoever that person is, oh my God. Apparently he said that he was and still is a bright young man. So that guy sounds like a complete wacko. The trial lasted two weeks, and on February the 14th, both attorneys delivered their closing arguments to the jury. Each attorney was allowed to speak for two hours, and defense attorney Gerald Boyle argued first. He repeatedly referred to the testimony of the mental health professionals, 
So there were a bunch of mental health professionals who came in, almost all of who had agreed that Jeffrey had a mental disease. And Jeffrey's lawyer argued that this means that he's insane. He portrayed Jeff as a desperately lonely and profoundly sick individual, so out of control that he could not control himself. Following the defense counsel's closing argument, Michael McCann delivered his closing argument for the prosecution, describing Jeffrey Dahmer as a sane man in full control of his actions who simply attempted to avoid detection. McCann described Jeffrey Dahmer as calculating and he killed to control his victims and retained their bodies merely to afford himself a prolonged period of sexual pleasure. He argued that by pleading guilty but insane, to the charges, Jeffrey Dahmer was seeking to escape responsibility for his crimes. On February the 15th, Jeffrey Dahmer was ruled to be sane and not suffering from a mental disorder. I believe that Jeffrey Dahmer was born with a chemical imbalance. I do believe that, but I also believe that he should go to jail. And he did. Formal sentencing was postponed until February the 17th. And on this date, Jeffrey's attorney announced his client wished to address the court. Jeffrey Dahmer then read from a statement prepared by himself and his defense as he faced the judge and that he frankly wished for his own death. He wanted the death penalty. He further stressed that none of his murders had been motivated by hatred, that he understood that nothing he either said or did could undo the terrible harm he had caused to the families of the victims and the city of Milwaukee and that he and his doctors believed his criminal behavior had been motivated by mental disorders. He added that this medical knowledge had given him some peace and that although he understood that society would never forgive him, he hoped that God would. So Jeffrey closed his statement with, I know my time in prison will be terrible but I deserve whatever I get because of what I have done. Thank you, Your Honour, and I am prepared for your sentence, which I know will be the maximum. I ask for no consideration. Then he returned to his seat and he awaited formal sentencing. Jeffrey Dahmer was then sentenced to life imprisonment plus 10 years upon the first two counts. The remaining 13 counts carried a mandatory sentence of life imprisonment plus 70 years. The death penalty was sadly not an option because Wisconsin had abolished capital punishment in 1853. I know some people are for and against, but I feel like a person like Jeffrey Dahmer, he deserved the death penalty. After the sentencing was read out, Jeffrey's father Lionel and stepmom requested to be allowed a 10 minute private meeting with their son before he was transferred to the Columbia Correctional Institution in Portage to begin his sentence. This request was granted and the trio exchanged hugs and well wishes before he was escorted away. Three months after his conviction in Milwaukee, Jeffrey was extradited to Ohio to be tried for Stephen Hicks's death. In a court hearing lasting just 45 minutes, Jeff again pleaded guilty to the charges and he was sentenced to a 16th term of life imprisonment on May the 1st, 1992. Upon sentencing, he was transferred to the Columbia Correctional Institution. For the first year of his incarceration, he was placed in solitary confinement because they were concerned for his safety. With good reason, because of what happens at the end. Many people from all over the world would write to him while he was in prison, with several of them donating money, which Jeff spent on items like cassette recordings, stationery, smokes, and magazines. People were giving him money. Jeff wanted to be put into the general population at the prison, and after a year in solitary, he was transferred. He was assigned two hours a day to work and cleaned the toilet block. This work later expanded to include cleaning the prison gymnasium. Jeff asked if he could have a Bible, and this request was granted. Jeffrey then devoted himself to Christianity, and he became a born-again Christian, 
and in May 1994 he was baptized by a minister. This was the day that he was baptized was also the day that John Wayne Gacy was executed and apparently there was like a solar eclipse or something. It's so weird. I'm going to make a story about it. So on July the 3rd 1994 a fellow, a fellow inmate attempted to slash Jeffrey Dahmer's throat with a razor that was hidden in a toothbrush but he only received superficial wounds and was not seriously hurt in this incident. According to Jeffrey's family he had long been ready to die and accepted any punishment which he might receive in prison. In addition to his dad and stepmom maintaining regular contact, Jeff's mum Joyce also maintained regular contact with her son but prior to his arrest the two had not seen each other since Christmas of 1983. On the morning of November the 28th 1994 Jeffrey left his cell to do his assigned work and was accompanied by two other inmates. These were Jesse Anderson and Christopher Scarva. I'm, so, I'm sure we have all heard of Christopher Scarva. The trio were left unsupervised in the showers of the prison gym for approximately 20 minutes. And at approximately 8.10 a.m. Jeffrey Dahmer was discovered on the floor of the bathrooms of the gym suffering from extreme head wounds. He was a mess. He had been severely beaten to his head and his face with a 20 inch metal bar and his head had also been repeatedly struck against the wall in the assault. Although he was still alive and was rushed to hospital he was pronounced dead one hour later. Anderson, the other guy, had also been beaten with the same instrument and he died from his wounds two days later. Christopher Scarva, who was serving a life sentence for murder committed in 1990, told authorities that he first attacked Jeffrey with the metal bar as he was cleaning a staff locker room before attacking Anderson as Anderson cleaned an inmate locker room. According to Christopher Scarva, Jeffrey Dahmer did not yell or make any noise as he was attacked. Immediately after attacking both the men, Christopher Scarver, who was thought to be schizophrenic, returned to his cell and he told a prison guard that God told me to do it and that Jesse Anderson and Jeffrey Dahmer are dead. Christopher Scarver was adamant that he had not planned the attacks in advance, although he later divulged to investigators that he had concealed the 20 inch iron bar used to kill both men in his clothing shortly before the killings. When Jeffrey Dahmer's mum was told that her son was dead, she responded very angrily to the media. So Joyce Dahmer said, now is everyone happy? Now that he's bludgeoned to death, is that good enough for everyone? I'm sorry honey, but look at what your son did. The response of the families of Jeffrey Dahmer's victims was mixed. Some celebrated the news, while others were saddened. Catherine Lacey, the mother of victim Oliver Lacey said, the hurt is worse now because he's not suffering like we are. They wanted him alive in prison to suffer years and years and years. The district attorney who prosecuted Jeffrey cautioned against turning Scarver into a folk hero saying that the death was still murder and on May the 15th 1995 Christopher Scarver was sentenced to two additional life terms for killing Jeffrey Dahmer and Anderson. Jeffrey Dahmer had stated in his will that he wanted no funeral and that he wanted to be cremated. So in September of 95 his body was cremated and his ashes were divided between his parents. So there was a disagreement between Jeffrey Dahmer's parents over whether their son's brain should be retained for medical research. So his brain was initially kept but later it was cremated in December of 1995. I kind of wish they did have it sent off for research 
Also, the apartment building where Jeffrey Dahmer had killed 12 of his victims was demolished in November of 1992, and this site is now basically a vacant lot. They say that there was a park put there, but nobody wants to go on it. There are plans to convert the site into a memorial garden, but I'm not sure if that's happened yet. A civic group, Milwaukee Civic Pride, was quickly established in an effort to raise the funds to purchase and destroy many of Jeffrey Dahmer's possessions, and the group pledged $407,000, including $100,000 by Milwaukee real estate developer Joseph Zilber for purchase of Jeffrey's estate. Five of the eight families agreed to the terms, and Jeffrey's possessions were destroyed and buried in an undisclosed Illinois landfill. And in 94, Lionel published a book, it's called A Father's Story, and Jeffrey Dahmer um, was quite shocked by it after he read his dad's book, but he, he's not mad that his dad made a book, he's like, he's, he was fine with it. Joyce, Jeffrey's mum, she died of cancer on November the 27th, 2000, and prior to her death, she had attempted to take her own life on at least one occasion. Jeffrey Dahmer's younger brother, David, he changed his surname, and he lives a private life. Lionel Dahmer would visit his son once a month. He still loves his son, but he doesn't understand why he did what he did. Most of the families showed support for Lionel, although three families sued him for using their names in his book without obtaining prior consent. So Jeffrey Dahmer killed 17 young men between 1978 and 1991. I don't understand some people. It's just so unbelievably sad. And this brings us to the end of today's story feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section below and please don't forget to hit the like button turn on the notifications button and subscribe to my youtube channel for more of my videos this was an incredibly hard story to tell like trying to keep my composure but i'm sure you guys noticed like i did cry a bunch of times but i tried to keep myself going oh <sighs> It was a really hard story to tell. Also, if you are listening via my podcast and would like to see the video, you can find me on YouTube. My name is Kate Sharon, True Crime. Please remember that all proceeds from this video will be going to the Milwaukee Crime Stoppers. So please share this video. And if you can make a donation by using Super Thanks, that would be absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with me. I know I didn't really put much of my usual liveliness into this one, but honestly, this is the most draining story to tell. That's probably why I'm slumped in my chair now. <laughs> oh, okay, I need to go and hug a puppy. But yeah, any money that I earn from this video is going to the Milwaukee Crime Stoppers. So please do support the cause. I really want to be somebody who helps. I really want to be, I really want to help victims. So I feel like with a few of my videos, I'm going to donate. I'm going to donate. And that's me. I'm out. I need to go. This is exhausting. Seriously, I I actually don't think I want to talk about Jeffrey Dahmer for a very long time. A very long time. I felt like such a robot in telling this story. I was just like sitting here just telling the story. Because I had to kind of like desensitize myself briefly. But then I kind of just lost it. Like it becomes so emotional. And I'm so grateful. I am so grateful to Tracy. I call him Tracy the Saviour. He's honestly like a hero. He saved any future victims. He is the reason that Jeffrey Dahmer was put away. And that's me. I'm going to go now. Please do subscribe to my channel. Um, if you want to help with the donation to Crime Stoppers, please hit that super thanks button. It only has to be a couple of bucks. If we all put it, put in a couple of bucks each, I'm, I'll do it as well. Um, it will it will help. It will help so much.
they can't do it without us they can't do it without people's help okay i'm leaving it there have a great day guys bye